So Genesis chapter 35, 16 to 29. Some journeys are longer than others. Last week, as many of you know, we went up to Anglesey to visit Darren's brother Lee and sister Amy. And it's the first time that we've seen them since just after Christmas, because of course the lockdown has meant we've not been able to travel and to visit. And so it was really lovely to catch up with them and see what they'd been getting up to. But the journey back from Anglesey was a nightmare. Normally takes five hours, whichever route you take, you can't seem to do it in less than five hours. But last Friday, it took us seven and a half hours. The traffic was terrible. But by God's grace, we got home safely and in one piece. And of course, that's what matters, isn't it? Now, Jacob's journey from Paddan Aram had been even longer. And it was very eventful indeed. He'd met up with his brother Esau, who he hadn't seen since he'd cheated him out of his inheritance and his blessing. He'd made an ill-advised stopover at Shechem, which caused misery for Dinah and death to the Shechemites. But God had put him on the right path again, had sent him to Bethel, where he should have been, all along. And today we get the final stage of Jacob's journey. Well, it's three stages really, and we'll look at each of those stages in turn. And each one of them has their own particular sadness. So let's look at them together. Verses 16 to 20 are on the way to Ephrath. And here we get a real mixture of joy and sorrow. There's the news that Rachel is going to have another baby. After struggling with infertility all of her married life, she's finally conceived again and brought the baby to term. And that should be a time of great joy, shouldn't it? But life is fragile. And especially for women, in the days before trained midwives and doctors and hospitals. And we don't even get the pregnancy announcement, do we? Just the statement, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And your heart breaks for her and Jacob, doesn't it? The moment that they had longed for is turning into tragedy. But that's what life is often like, isn't it? Even for God's people. Because our world is broken. And it's longing to be restored. As Paul says in Romans 8.22, the whole creation has been groaning. But that groaning will end when Jesus returns. And when Jesus brings with him the new heaven and the new earth. And when we face tragedy, as we all do from time to time, it doesn't mean that you've necessarily done something wrong or that God is singling you out. It is simply part of living in this world as we long for the future perfect world with Jesus. And so grieve as you need to, as we all need to, from time to time. But don't despair. Rachel gives birth to her son and she's able to see him before she dies. She names him Ben Oni, son of my trouble. And that is a name born of sorrow, isn't it? But Jacob chooses not to keep that name. This time, He's going to name the child. Remember when all the babies were being born, it was the women who named them. Here, he's naming this child. And he will be Benjamin, son of my right hand. Because good has come out of the sorrow. And as onlookers, we can see that, can't we? Because now Benjamin has been born, the 12 tribes are complete. God is at work 
even through the sorrow. And Rachel herself gets a suitable tribute. Did you notice, unlike Rebecca, her death is noted, and more than that, Jacob marks her grave with a pillar. And her death has never been forgotten. Not only are we reading about it now, thousands of years later, but there is still a monument to Rachel in Israel today. Now, it's probably not the original one. It's got a crusader style to it. But nevertheless, she's remembered there. And that is quite a tribute. But as we reflect on that, don't forget it's not the size of the monument on our grave that matters, but what God thinks of us. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. Even if we have no one to mourn us here, we are known and loved by God. Well, Jacob can't stay on the road to Ephrath. Even though he's buried his beloved Rachel there, he has got to move on. And in verses 21 and 22, we find him pitching his tent in Migdal Eda. And don't forget, of course, he's not alone. He's got his other wife, his, his two, the two servant girls, all of the children, all of the rest of the family, all of the flocks and the herds and so forth. And Rachel's death will have affected them all in some way. Because none of us are untouched when a family member dies. But for some in the family, a death can be seen as an opportunity. Now, Reuben, he has seen the vacuum that Rachel has left. And so he acts on it. Verse 22, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah. Now, this wasn't just an act of lust. Now, Bilhah was Rachel's servant girl and by defiling her he ensures that she won't be able to take Rachel's place in the family. His mother Leah will have that prime place and it's also a bit of a leadership bid for himself because by sleeping with his father's concubine he's challenging that leadership role. He's putting himself forward as the leader. It's exactly what Absalom does to David in 2 Samuel chapter 16 verses 21 and 22. Now Reuben didn't need to do all of that. He was already the eldest. He would be the one to inherit the leadership and the promises of God. And so it all smacks once again of a lack of trust in God, doesn't it? He's like doing it to reinforce it, to make sure, to kind of belt and braces the whole thing. Not really trusting in God. And don't we often do stupid things as well when we lose that trust that God will look after us, that God will hold us safe. Now our writer slips in now this list of Jacob's sons so that we can see where Reuben sits in that family tree. And as we look at it, it also points us to something else. We can see Reuben is the oldest, but his actions are going to mean that God does not bestow his blessing on Reuben. Jacob will remove that blessing on his deathbed. We see that in chapter 49, verses 3 to 4. We've already seen Simeon and Levi, the next two sons down, they're not going to inherit the blessing either because of what they did to the Shechemites. Remember their sister Dinah was raped, which was a, a despicable act, but they went then and virtually raped the whole city, slaughtering the men and carrying off the women and the children. And so the leadership and the promises will fall on the next son down. And who's the next son in the list? 
Judah, isn't it? Judah, where David will come from and ultimately Jesus. But there is a little touch of grace even here. Now, Reuben did a terrible thing. He hurt Bilhah and he messed things up for himself. And although it meant that he wasn't going to inherit those promises, God didn't chuck him out of the family either, did he? Because Reuben would stay. He would be one of those 12 tribes of Israel, a really important character in the history of God's people. And I think there is great encouragement there for us because we might mess up from time to time. We might even willfully do something bad. And though there will be consequences to those things, if we belong to God, he won't abandon us and he won't throw us out. He'll discipline us. His Holy Spirit will nudge us until we repent. But he won't ever throw us out of the family. And that is the most wonderful assurance. Hold on to that tightly. Well, the final part of Jacob's journey is in verses 27 to 29, and he is back at Mamre. Verse 27 is wonderful, and if you picked it up when I read it earlier, Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre. Jacob came home. Well, he's been on quite a journey, hasn't he? From the young deceiver in verse 27, who had to flee for his life, to now be in Israel, father of the 12 tribes. He's back in the place of Abraham and Isaac. And the author's telling us that things are now back how they should be. Isaac has got to be with his son before he dies. And did you notice both Esau and Jacob are there together to bury their father? There's a wonderful completeness about that, isn't there? God has brought it all back together again. And what if you spotted the familiar words in verses 28 and 29? Isaac lived 180 years. Then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years. It's what's said about Abraham, isn't it? And as we followed the life of Isaac, we saw that he was not perfect, but God blessed him anyway. And doesn't that give us hope too? Wolke, the commentator, writes, Some saints soar with the wings of eagles, Others run, and some only walk. Nevertheless, all complete the journey. So don't despair. You might feel that you are the weakest, most useless follower of Jesus. But if you are his, he will make sure that you complete your journey, your journey with him, until you are safely home with your father in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? So what do we learn about God in this half chapter? Well, we see again his grace and his compassion. Even though his people mess up, he doesn't cast them aside. Rather, he brings them home. We also see his sovereign hand at work behind the scenes. As by the end of this chapter, the heads of the 12 tribes have been born even though it's at the cost of Rachel's life. And as we look forward to the new Israel that Jesus brought into existence, we know it's at the cost of his life. This is the generous, loving, self-sacrificing God we worship. What do we learn about people? Well, we've seen that life can be really tough. People we love die, and it is hard. But we are not without hope.
One day Jesus will return and he will bring with him the new heaven and the new earth without any death or mourning or crying or pain. We've also seen that we can make things so much harder for ourselves and for others by not trusting that God will keep his promises. Reuben's distrust and ambition hurt Bilhar as well as impacting his own future. Will we not trust our lives to the God who loves us? And finally, what about God's promises? Well, the family are back in the land, in the right bit of the land, where they're meant to be. The heads of the 12 tribes have been born and Isaac, in spite of his failings, is blessed by God. So those promises, land, offspring, blessing, we see them all being fulfilled in different ways. And you'd expect now that our next chapter would take us through the life of Judah, wouldn't you? because he's the next one um, through whom those promises are going to be. But with God, there are always surprises. Keep studying Genesis with me to find out what they are. Well, a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your kindness and your generosity. We thank you that you don't repay us as our sins deserve. We thank you that even though we mess up accidentally, even though we willfully walk away from you at times, you have promised that you will never leave us or forsake us. So give us the assurance that being one of your children gives us. And we pray that you would help us to trust in your promises day by day. Thank you for the example of these great figures of history Thank you that they were flawed just as we are, so that we know we don't have to be superhero saints to be your people. Just know that we are made and loved by you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.